welcome to um, my class on, on Norse ethnomusicology. Um, I'm still working on this. I was supposed to give this presentation about a month ago at, a, at the University of Wilfrid Wart uh, Laurier in, in, in Ontario. And uh, I said, they asked me, what, are, what courses are you going to teach at the symposium this year? And I said, well, I'll teach this course and then I'll do one, of the, one or two of the other usual ones I do. And they signed me up for all the other ones and they forgot to put this one on schedule. So I just think they already around finishing it. Which is good because I kept getting sidetracked every time I went researching. So it's still only half finished and it probably will take more time than I have available. So the next person gets to shut me up just like, you know. Anyway, okay, so what is ethnomusicology? Well, it's the study of music in its cultural context. It approaches music as a social process in order to understand what, not only what music is, but why it is. And what it means to practitioners, the audience, and how those meanings are conveyed. That's one definition. Or, is this, in other words, is a scientific study of any world culture in terms of its actual sounds, okay. performance practices, and relationship to a in a relationship to a specific culture in comparison with other cultures. Okay, so I'm going to try and focus on the second definition and, and I'll get sidetracked along the way. There's a way it goes. Okay, actual sounds. We don't have any. <laughs> it's a bit a little bit frustrating at times. What do we have? The best we've got is this um, one law code written in the 1300s, and it's got music notes and runes. Oh. And it's a lovely song. It goes like this: Runde mi hon runde not um silky och erlich hell, which translates to "Last night I had a dream of silk and fine fur." And that's all we've got. So we're out of luck. Don't even have one complete song. There's more notes after there, but they ran out of words. Uh, yeah, and if you work on the on the on it, it comes out to a theme? variation on the theme. Oh, you're right. And so the question is, are they setting that up for, and that's just a shorthand, they're going, okay, so, and then next time you sing it, you're going to do this little change, which is what I would do, like if I was trying to scribble it in the bottom of the law code, and, and you know, you, you don't have a lot of space, you know, okay, okay, well, I know that, I just need to know which song I'm talking about, I'll put the first line in, after that, everybody knows it. That's the problem with oral culture. Um, jerks. Um, so, beyond that, then we've got quotes. We've got all sorts of neat quotes that people wrote along the ways. <laughs> and this is one from, a, from the, the Southerners. Never be heard have I heard uglier songs than those of Vikings. The growling sound coming from the throats reminds me of dogs howling, <laughs> only more untamed. <laughs> or from the priests. The word of God should be heard when the priests eat together. They should listen to the lector, not to the liar, to sermons, of, not to the vernacular. What has Ingbeld got to do with Christ? Our house is not wide enough to hold them both. The king of heaven wants nothing to do with a damn pagans holding the title of king. Ouch. <laughs> right? Which says the king's got vernacular songs that he's using. Or another priest. Huh. It's said that the songs being sung during the ceremony are numerous and obscene, so it's better not to say anything about them. Is <laughs> sounding similar to the lecture we just now heard? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, beyond that, we then have the Finnish tradition matched to it. This comes from the Kalevala. The Kalevala is an epic poem. It's like 400 pages long. Um, it actually wasn't written down until much later, 1800s, but it's coming, the, the fellow who put it together, put it together from the oral tradition. So he's got, um, all these stories are going in there. Um, and the thing is, they have this strong link of magic and the words. At one point, they're the, uh, Venomone, they're their greatest hero. And he's the greatest hero because he's the greatest magician, because he's the greatest musician. He forgets a word to a song. And he goes out and slaughters a thousand geese and then kills out another a couple thousand deer trying to get the magic word back. Finally goes and finds the giant griffin and wakes him up and says, Hey, 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 hey! Poking him in the nose. Give me the word I need. 
And he says, no, and swallows him. At which point he kind of pokes around the inside of him, gives him heartburn, call it, finally the giant lets him back out and he, and he gives him the word. Um, but that's the thing, one word is lost and he can't do it. And there's another case that this one here, it's telling about the birth of fire. And you get these stories through the, the Kalevala, and these ones especially when they're, they're, they're actually magical chants, they kind of got them in the story, that, that you know that they must not change them. Because if they change them, they'll lose the magic. So which really calls, or I don't care when it was written down, oral tradition says it ain't changing, right? Um, for all these who just came from the Jewish class, right? The, 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 the whole way that the, 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 the Torah is written out, you know, they do it in such a, um, a ritualistic way so that nothing changes. Okay, so, um, and that's what you're just, you're, you're just listening to this, to this story about the birth of fire. Um, okay. It was important to preserve the original text in order to protect the magic. Yeah. But what was the point of the magic exactly? Well, the whole point is that if you knew, a so for example, the, the, uh, the, the um, there's another story about the birth of iron. Vainamoyne is making this boat for a girl who's, who's kind of flirting with him and, and really doesn't want to do any, have anything to do with him. And his axe cuts off a stone and cuts himself. But he doesn't know the magic to stop his wound. And he's gushing and it uh, talks about him filling valleys and things like that. And so before he can heal his wound, he has to find out about the origins of iron so that by knowing the truth of its origins, he can then sing to it and then have power over it by, no, by through this. And that's kind of the way their magic works a lot. Okay, but the purpose of the magic in that context of, they wanted the magic in order to preserve what they had in place already? Is that, I mean, they needed that magic in order to make sure that the crops, the crops prospered and the fishermen came back with a full load of fish. There, there, the yeah, there's, 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 there's all kinds of different different pieces of magic that they use in every day. Okay. They I, like to. What comes to mind? The, the Mayans. One of the reasons why they think Mayan culture collapsed is because there was so much emphasis on the godlike authority of the rulers. And when the rulers couldn't make the crops grow anymore, right. when they couldn't keep famine and drought from coming through, the whole culture fell apart. Yeah. And I would wonder about the same thing. You sing these magical songs and if the magic doesn't work, then maybe you change the songs? Yeah, and, 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 and then, it, then it, that's the, that gives the conservatives a chance to say, see, see, you guys in modern fellows, don't, don't you go changing the things. Okay, I'm not sure. it could go either direction. Yeah. You could say, we change things and the gods are mad at us and therefore things aren't working anymore. Yeah. Okay. It, it, there's, and so, this is where this is where it's going to take a lot more to, to find out, and it, and in a lot a lot of cases, we can't know some of it. But there are hints and pieces, and so I'll I'll, I'll try and the topic's a lot broader than I've got for now. Oh sure. So just stay with me. I'm going to I'm going to do a lot of skipping. Um, yeah yeah. Um, so um, similarly, you've got in because. Uh, Really what I'm doing is I'm trying to, try to, try to cover <coughs> several different cultures because they're all related. They're, they're, we link them together as the Norse college, cultures and we've got the Dan Danish and the, and the Norwegians and the Swedes and the Finns. But really they all are very different and, and also the, the Rus too. Because um, they're all from the, the related cultures but they're all very independent um, in terms of what happens to them and why. Um, but you do see a lot of similarities. So the have them all the kind of the, the premier text in the Norse culture um, also has a whole series de devoted to these magic spells, um, which also show up in songs much later. Um, so were they sung or not? The problem is that the Norse word for singing is also the Norse word for speaking. And it's, uh, you know, yeah, I hate, hate that sort of thing. So, so the question is, did they were they chanting their the, the speeches? You know, and sometimes you, you're looking at the when it actually says you know, and he's saying this as he jumped onto the boat and started fighting with the other guys. And go, no, no, that's that didn't really happen that way. <laughs> um, but sometimes you know he's saying this as he as, as, as in front of the king. Okay, I, I'll buy that one, right? Um, but most of the, the um, Snorri Sturluson is our uh, one of our main writers of, of the. 
of the Norse texts. And he wrote down that, he talks about his sources and he says, part is written down after old songs and ballads. Right? And then here's the thing. This is 12, 1200s. Um, they've got a strong, you can already argue there, there's a strong ballad tradition. The, the problem we have with, with this, again, the ballads were written down later. When were they actually created? Um, How much have they changed? Um, I was in, sitting in, um, well, we were talking about, about the, the, the French traditions and, and which came first, the chicken or the egg. And that's one of the things that I, I have, don't have a lot of time to, to go into in detail, but what I want to really go in with ethnomusicology is how much influence was coming in from the other places around them, right? France is just down, down to the south. They, we know they had trading routes down there. There's all sorts of um, cultural things that are coming north. How much is indigenous and how much is imported? And yeah. how much do things change one way or the other? Um, here's one of the old texts. Um, it, um, which translates to, in the beginning when Ymir lived, there was neither sea nor sand nor any cold waves, there was neither earth nor heaven above, there was only the Ganunga Gap, but grass nowhere. This is, the, this is the, one of the origin stories. Right? Again, this is one of the ones written by, down by Hartman in 1700s. He had been listening to some Icelandic sailors and were really hoping that nothing changed because Iceland's an island. And the text we've got from several hundred years earlier. So we're going, okay, we've got the text. We've got a tune several hundred years too late. But if we're lucky, things haven't changed. And that's always a, that's always a risk. But islands never change. <laughs> um, so here's the other musical tradition that's weird, and I'm just beginning to get into it. Um, Gerald is Cambridge. Um, Gerald of Cambridge. Anyway, a really important writer, and he wrote this. Also in the northern parts of Britain, that is, beyond Humber and around York, the people who inhabit these parts use a similar kind of singing in symphonic harmony, but with a variety of only two distinct melodies and parts, one murmuring below, the other equally soothing and charming to the ear above. Yet in both nations, this sp st special style has been acquired not by studied art, but by long usage, so that it has now become as if it were a habit of second nature. And this now has become so strong in either nation and taken such firm roots that no one ever hears simple unison singing, but either with many voices, as in former, as in Wales, or nevertheless at least two as in the latter, in Northern England. And what is more marvelous, even children, and even deep infants, almost from the first turn, from tears to song, follows in the same fashion of singing. Since the English do not generally use this manner of singing, but only the Northerners, I believe that it is from the Danes and the Norwegians who often used to occupy this part of the island, and were wont to hold them for long periods of time, and that the inhabitants have acquired likewise their affinities of speech and their special manner of singing. What you're listening to is a hymn to St. Magnus. Obviously it's a Christian hymn, obviously it's a couple hundred years too late, but it's still too early for parallel thirds. Right? But it's a gorgeous piece. Is this what, 13th century? Uh, yeah, the, uh, the, we don't have an exact date. Right. Um, Magnus was, was um, 11th century. So it can't be before that. Yeah, so it can't be before that. Um, okay. And I'm, I'm pretty sure the, I, I'm pretty sure they've got it absolutely before 1400. But I'm, I've, where, where it's been narrowed down to, I, I can't tell. Um, but it's it's just a, a, a gorgeous gorgeous piece, and it just doesn't follow what you see elsewhere. Well, it just, in a way, it makes a little bit of sense because we know that the, that English music used a lot more thirds, even yeah, later period. Just, than, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and this is what this is what I have to go. So, I'm I'm just been just in the last week or so I've found out about these gamelles. 
Um, and this is an example of the English, right? Also in the having the, the same sort of parallelism. Um, and I haven't been able to find out more specifically where this is in England this is. Is this from the north? Is this from the south? Um, the Oxford Dictionary of Music said as early as the 10th or 11th century. Well, gee, thanks, guys. Um, where, did where did you get that from? <laughs> Um, because nobody, because I didn't find any other source. All the other sources were talking 1300s. Um, well, look at some of the, the other Gemells, like you know, Eddie Bay and. Well, I'm, that's the thing. I'm I'm just getting into this. Like I didn't even hear the term before for this last one. That's what this says. Yeah, yeah that's that's what I've got. Um, Have you looked at Ben Bagby's research? He's done a lot of stuff. Not there yet. Okay. Anyway. Hello. Hello. Wake up. Um, back to the Norse ones. This is another one of Hartman's ones that was writing down in the 1700s. Um, I really like this song because it was a, uh, it's 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 the poems attributed to Harold Aldrada, and it's just a great song because it's going basically it comes down to, I sailed my ship down to Sicily and this girl still won't go out with me. <laughs> um, and, and the fellow was just making this, and the one research I came across made the argument that because he, uh, he's ending on, on thirds, that this may have been only part of, uh, and I don't. It's just I, a different yeah. tonation. Um, but the tonation is actually odd enough that there's something different about this piece, because it doesn't match any of the other pieces from that. Let's see. Suit for room out through the Prince Grave, well, till the Navengi shot here on Dengum. But here at mid at Muti, my knee on thinking in tra. So let me get you go room, both rings get me a shola. Okay, so what do we got so far? We've got they use vocal stuff, multiple singers, numerous, offensive, Catholic morality. At least the priest didn't like it, and we've got two parts singing. Okay, what else do we got? Um, Finnish melodies, a little bit different, really, really narrow ranges. Um, in fact, there's uh, some little bits and pieces of Finland where they've gotten like a note range of three, <laughs> like it's going. How can you have a song? But if you can kind of hear this one, right? It doesn't go anywhere. And really is just a musical version of a chant. Like, like, like it, 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 it's all about the text, not about the music. Um, and the thing about chanting is usually, again, chanting is there because you you need to focus on the words and you don't want to be thinking about the music, right? Um, is it also because it was easier to hear? You could project the sound over a larger space. You and because you, could, it, you could, could choose your range and, and not have to worry about the lows that you couldn't and the highs. Yeah, maybe. You could probably sing it longer single. Um, yeah, before microphones, you can project a lot better singing than you can speaking. Wasn't it in, within okay. the Catholic Church in the medieval period? Wasn't more the homilies more yes. sung or chanted? Yes, yes. I, I, and, and I. I um, I once uh, attended mass at, at a, a Catholic church in uh, in Vienna. It was still doing the old song mass, and it was it was, it was really quite interesting to uh, how well it carried within that environment because they weren't doing um, anything else that was usual, and they were designed that way so they can carry a lot farther. Um, we're going to get to locations here for this. Hopefully, I don't know if I'm running out of space. Um, I was just going to compare that one with. So here's the second one. And you can hear the same range, same sort of structure. Um, it's following the the the, the text. The rhythm's there, but it doesn't always hold true. Okay. 
Um, now, the last time I did this talk here, I, I kind of went on all about the instruments and I kind of lost the rest of the talk and I want to do that. So I'm just going to focus on a couple today. Um, back to another uh, Roman wandering around Saxon Germanicus. Um, <coughs> and he's talking here about the lyre. And first he performed the various pieces so that everyone was filled with grief and numbness, and afterwards the sound of the lyre forced them into an impudent and lively state of mind, the jesting tunes which made them eager to move their bodies, and they commenced to exchange anguish for applause. Finally, it enraged them to madness and rashness, so they were seized by madness, and an utter fury gave great cries. Thus the state of their minds was changed variously. Therefore, when the music within the hall came to an end, they saw the king was driven into madness and rage, so they were unable to restrain him. The interesting thing about this is not connected to him at all. There's a whole Norse saga about um, Basia and Herod. They um, break into a wedding, okay, by killing the guards, getting him and putting the skins on after flailing the... Um, and then join the band, and, and they, they play the harp so wildly that everybody has to get up and dance, kind of like in the old, the old fairy tales, and they can't stop. And when everybody's begging for mercy, they say, oh, faster? Okay. <laughs> and then they steal the bride by stuffing her in the harp and, 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 and making off with her. Um, but um, it certainly does prove two things. Um, one, that they were using instruments. <laughs> Um, and we've got all sorts of stories about lyres and harps. Again, the annoying thing about the Norse is it's the same word. So whether they had the, um, the old, um, the, the lyre shape that we're used to from, from or, or the, the, the three-cornered Irish harps, you know, and what's the difference really? Number of strings, eh, who cares? Um, not only with this, but the, the harp was important. It made the list of things that a good noble should be able to do. Gamble. Right? Nine skills. You're supposed to be able to gamble, read, ski, and tell poems and play the harp. And often enough, there are, and the harp is the last thing on the list. So does that mean is it over center is it most important? Um, this is the, this is the the earliest lyre I found a founder picture of. This is a Trussingen lyre, um, and it really changes very little before we get to the the Osberg and things. And I already mentioned that. All right. Um, in Finland, you've got the the Kanteli, which is almost the lyre, but not quite. The, and I really should have packed my lyre along, but I was always get worried about how much room there's going to be in the car. Um, with the lyre, you can actually play it several ways. And I've gotten into fights with Benzik with people about, oh, you can't play it that way. Going, yeah, right, I can't. Because <laughs> um, people say the only way you do it is you strum it like this, and you you make chords by by stopping the strings from behind. Okay, that's fine, but I can play it melodically. You can't stop me. Um, the um, the one the one that find that I found that that's um, of all the finds that's really most important to me is the little panpipe they found in York, because after a thousand years the panpipe's still in tune. Wow. So I think, hmm, let's see, they can still play this and still have the same sounds. I got my tonal scale, and one of the things when I'm going through the, the music and saying, okay, is this music? Right or not, you know, looking at the the Hartman music from seventeen hundreds, I can play it on that pin, on that panpipe, right? Oh. And so if I can pay, play it on there, should I be able to play it on my harp on the lyre as well? I think so. So I use that to, to tune the other, um, which gives me an, an an A to E scale. Oh. Um, the, in Finland, um, the cantale is really important. But it really is the same sort of thing. Again, it's it's a it's a tonally um, bit zither, right? It, um, each note, each string a different note, and you can play your songs on it, and it's plucked out. The only difference is instead of being up to here, you're playing it down on your lap, and or on your shoulder like something. Um, they also have another version um, in Norway called a langley, 
Um, and the big difference here is you're starting to get in, into droned instruments. Um, and you've got a fretboard. So you've got, you've got a melodic string or two and drones below. And the drones start taking on, um, we're not sure when they started out, and this is where I'm going, I'm not sure how early some of these, you know, there's a lot of people sort of up and down about this, but it becomes really important later on because you get into the bowed instruments. Now, the Rebex, there's references to fiddles and things like that. I don't doubt that there were bowed instruments. We're still lacking a lot of information I'd like to have. Um, but this is one of the ones that you, you look at and going, okay, was it theirs or did it come up from the south? Um, the Rebex, I think, absolutely came up from the south. Did they have bowed instruments before? I don't know. Besides the, the, the lyre, they've also got a bowed lyre, which I should have brought too, it's, but it's my lateral scroll. So, so, and, and it's, um, and when, with the boat lyre, the, the biggest difference is it's got a, it's, um, it's got a, a stick in the middle and you actually play your, it's got two drones and your melody is played by stopping the string with your fingernails and you just stop it sideways, um, which is really kind of unusual. Um, and it's because you, but again, you get into the drone strings and we know we had them when they first came about, still don't have enough information. And again, it's the thing that I think really probably came up from the south. Um, we, they had bowed instruments um, in, in the Middle East, and we know they were the Norse were trading with the Middle East. Um, it makes sense to me that they would say, oh, we've got this cool thing, you're going, well, I don't know how to build that, but I can build this thing. Can I just put a stick around the middle and, and, and do it that way instead? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, let's do that. Um, the earliest image I found from the north of a bowed lyre, this is, this is a, a, a version of their bowed lyre, and you can see he's, he's got it gripped in through a loop in the side. That's kind of a, like I was describing. And he, so he's playing with the back of his knuckles, like his back of his finger, <coughs> and that's how the strings are going. Um, were the strings they use mostly gut or metal? Yeah, yeah, they, they, would, have, they would have been gut or brass. Okay. Um, and, and that's the other thing. Um, so, this is late. It's really late. But it's unique to Norway. Nobody else has this instrument. <laughs> um, it's kind of hard to see, but there's a set of strings that run underneath. Oh. Huh. And you can't fret them. Hi. There are actually a lot, so I don't doubt that this specific kind of sympathetic string is unique to Norway. But there are a lot of other uh, string instruments in the violin family with sympathetic strings like that in Italy. Yeah. At around the same time. Um, yeah. But, but this has become their national. This has become their national um, instrument. It, it's it's everywhere. And, it, and then they talk about folk music. Ninety percent of it, they're they're playing this. Um, and again, it's this this use of the that extra buzz, that extra little droning thing. And what is this saying about the the music that? That they had from before. Why is it? Why did it come up? Why did it stay? And you know, this does say some things about the fact that you know, even if it was coming up from from some examples in Italy, it didn't catch on in the places in between. So it's it's yeah, made a skip. Yeah. Extra strings. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 All right. Performance practices. Um, how you perform, where you perform, and why you perform really changes the music that you do perform. Um, in the Norse culture, they don't have actually a lot of respect for kings for, you know, <laughs> Norse king saga. It's all about how the kings die bloody and stupid deaths. But the skalds, now those are people to respect. And they're, they're, they're considered the top, the top of, of the, the heap as far as, you know, um, the, the, their, their cultural setup. But then they've got the, the Lake Harry, and, and these are the traveling musicians. Now, I, I'm still finding out more about what exactly the nuances are. Um, I've got some, the, uh, I, I don't think I actually got that, the, the, the quote in here because it was uh, 
um, pretty long. Um, this one here, the uh, it, this one, I, I, guess I was starting to do it, and I didn't get the didn't figure out how to paste it in. But that they they talk about they carry um, juggling leather phalluses that are lit a fire over <laughs> around the hall. So <laughs> apparently they weren't just musicians; they were also they were they were they were traveling performers. Um, but we do have this quote here, which talks about the Lake Henry um, playing the harp and the digging and all these other instruments. Jigger could be the Geiger, could yeah. the violin then. Yeah. Harp so violin. so we do we do have certainly a whole slew of instruments that they're being played. Um, now the, the argument here is that, that they they're this is if they're not in Scandinavia at this point, they're they're also they're looking at um, complete influence from the south. So the question is, are these traveling musicians disliked because they're traveling musicians and nobody ever trusts a traveling musician, or because they're foreigners and they're just coming in? They're 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 coming up from from Germany or other other places and, and just making the the grand tour. Um, and you never trust the foreigners. They're always going to steal from you. Um, so, you get the performers in the hall. Um, by comparison, we've got the Calavala, and, and I, I'm a little scattered at this point in this presentation. But when they do the Calavala, it's all about they cross their hands and they're, 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 they're reciting it backwards. I am wanting, I am thinking, to arise and go forth singing. Sing my songs and say my sayings, hymns ancestral harmonizing, lore of kindred, the lyric king. Um, that's the beginning of the, the, of the Kalevala. Um, and then it goes on and says, Strike me now, hand into hand, fingers into curve of fingers, so that we may sing good songs, voice the best of all our legends, for the hearing of our loved ones, those who want to learn them from us, those among the rising young ones of the growing generation. Then it goes to talk about the magic verses we have gathered, kindled by the inspiration from the belt of Vainamoinen, under forge of Ilmarin, sword blade of the man far minded, it came with Yukahidin's crossbow, and so on and so forth. But the point is, they've got this ritual again about how you do the chant. And if you do this same movement all the time, it's, it's a, a bit of a memnonic, right? It, it's a way to, to stir this, it adding that bit of a ritual. Um, and it's the, this is the way we sing good songs. Right? This is the way we tell our stories. Um, the so it's there very is a student teaching or being taught by his master. When I started this, I assumed that, but I'm not sure that that's necessarily true. Um, and part of it is, is that what I'm getting on with is my research. I've been doing more and more into the Faroe Islands. I love these people. Again, small little tiny island. Nobody comes in. Nobody goes out. Um, and it really, really is like that case in this place. Did they have sheep? Um, oddly enough, they did. <laughs> um, so, and I haven't talked about setting yet. So uh, let's 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 take this this example of Faroe Islands. The longhouse, 27 feet by 20 feet, and this is a big one. Okay, so people got it, got that in mind of what it looks like. What 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 20 feet wide looks like? That's um, like half this room. Yeah, it's about the size of this room. And this is way bigger. Most longhouses, uh, if, um, I've done a, I've done worked at Lancel Meadows a number of times, which is the North Settlement in, uh, in Northern Newfoundland. And their longhouse is twice the size of the ones that were, there existed in Greenland, where they had come from settling. Um, our argument is always when we're going there, as they, they they took their, their longhouse and they were saying, let's make the sales house for the, you know, and, 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 and get try and, try and sell off the property by, by you know, come on in, look how prosperous we all are. Don't have anything like this at home, do you? Let me sell you a property around the corner. Because um, it just really is, it really is big. But it's only half the width of this room, right? Um, and there's, there's uh, several halls, um, but the largest of them is, maybe to here, okay? They're not very big spaces. Um, you didn't have the materials to build big spaces. You didn't have, um, the, you didn't have the fuel to keep them. You didn't have the fuel to keep them warm, right? Um, there were larger ones. Um, 
we know in the Norse King Saga they talk about um, the first Norse King died when he uh, got drunk with the with his friend buddy the one day, and they he, uh, they had a two fat, two story vat of mead, and the king had his bedroom on the second floor, <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, he, he had to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night, and he turned left instead of right. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> totally, they made fun of the kings. Um, but so when you're talking about an intimate space like this, if this is the largest hall you're going to get, right? Now, a couple things in, to keep in mind. Um, depending on where you are in, Nor in the Norse culture, the walls may be timber, but they're just as likely to be turf, which gives you a s real difference in acoustics. It sucks it in like anything. Um, when you're at when you're at Blancel Meadows, you're out in the galing wind, you step inside and going. If I calm down, I can't, you can't hear a thing. And and people people are around the room. You, they always sound like they're whispering, because it just the the, the turf just absorbs the sound. Wow. It's like it, you know like you can you imagine it, you, how how nicely grass quiet it is if you're lying down. You just imagine a whole building surrounding you of grass. Mm. Um, so. And then you've got to remember that there's a fire pit in the, going down the middle of this. So you don't have a, your performance space is cut in half. And all along the sides here are the benches, which are the beds, right? So you've really only got, you know, a very narrow spot for walking, performing in the middle. The Faroese have this tradition, the evening sit. And everybody would get together. Um, and they'd, uh, they'd have these um, recitations, songs, dances. They do this chain dance. Um, and they perform them, like I say, every Sunday between Christmas and Shrove Monday, on you know, holidays, marriages, banquets, celebrating killing a whale, anytime they have an excuse to get together, they're doing these dances. Um, I found one reference that, that uh, uh, one person on YouTube saying, "Yeah, I'm sorry that this has only got the uh, verses um, seven on because the first six that we were doing this is at a wedding, and the first six verses were done before the wedding, and I, and I didn't vi didn't get a chance to videotape it." <laughs> you can think about that. They did six verses of an epic song, then they had a wedding, and then they went back to the epic song again. We just don't think of that in our culture. Like that's just not something we would ever do. Um, my wife came and was like, well, "Well, I could see it maybe if, okay, well, the bride and groom were getting the pictures done." I go, "Okay, maybe that's a, a justification." But still, um, I'm not sure what song it was anymore. I can't remember whether it was one that actually might have been appropriate for you know wedding scenes because they the songs they, they cover history, they cover um, all sorts of weird stuff. But the chain dances are all, all in the same way. You link your arms with the person beside you, linking elbows, crossing arms, and it's one, two, one. One, two, one. Because there's no more room in the house. And you do it over and over and over again. And they've got a, they've got a skipper who, who leads the dance. Um, and he's the one who calls the verses. But it really is, even though there's one person who's kind of the, the, your bard, your storyteller, no. The more you look at these, if you watch the videos, everybody knows the words. Yeah. It just takes that one person to get everybody going. It's the, once upon a time, there's a story of Goldilocks and the... Yeah. Right? And everybody, and then from there, you, you've got a course that everybody knows, and there's the storyline that everybody goes to. Right? Yeah. And, and once you've got that sort of tradition, right? Um, the stories stay. So these go on for up to a hundred 
plus verses. The songs, the range of the tune is again not very narrow range, yeah. right? They've only got um, four lines to a verse, mm -hmm. and that's often including the chorus. Um, I was first introduced to these by by Dame Sivia years ago, um, and in her argument, that Vikings too too also dance and and. Uh, she was using the the, uh, the, the uh, example of um, oh my gosh, <laughs> can't, can't get things going through my head, but um, uh, of another story about a, about a guy who's who's in love and and he goes off to serve the king down in, in Constantinople and while he's gone his 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 fiance is feeling lonely and the mom says. You know, you should just re re marry the other, older brother. And she says, "No, no, no, no! I, I promise, I'm going to get married." And and uh, and they said, "Oh, no, no! Sorry, didn't we tell you? No, um, he doesn't love you anymore. No, no, I made a promise, I'm going to marry him. Uh, no, sorry, um, he's dead. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll marry the brother. And then guess what? Amy Skibbleson comes home and says, "So, what's going on?" Um, sisters meet him at the door saying, Look, I've got a big basket of gold coins. Take it. Why don't you go for a walk for a bit? <laughs> Why? Is something going on? Oh, just a wedding. You don't want to be there. Comes in. Wedding's already taken place. He meets his big bride and groom is going, Hi, I'm home. And she says, That's fantastic. I'm so looking forward to you. I, I loved you and you were gone, but I'm married now, so sorry. I can't break my promises. Oh. Well, I guess you have to die. Brother, you have to die. Dad, Mom, you have to die. And so it is Abel Skimmelson's treads on the wild path. And that's the chorus line. <laughs> um, these are not always happy songs. <laughs> and which is also the thing about you're telling about these they're, they're, they're the histories, but they're they're all they do have dark, weird things that come out of them. And because they're not dancing fast, they have the breath to be able to just keep on yeah. singing. Again, the dancing isn't for dancing like we're doing with Darius. Yeah. You know, this is not terpsichore. This is, I'm trying to remember what I'm doing. <laughs> but have you noticed anything yet? The music is in our standard eight bar phrases. The dance is in six. Oh, no. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So every time you hit the chorus, you're in a different spot. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I noticed that. Oh, I and, and so you're going, okay. Who the heck came up with this idea? I kind of like it though. It makes it keep like it's moving. So yeah. yeah, yeah. So it, it, because you can't don't have that stopping spot, nobody ever stops. <laughs> oh yeah, because it doesn't line up very well. Yeah. There's a community here. Yes. They're all in this together. They're joining hands and they're staying together. Not trading partners. There's no fancy footwork. It's all about everybody together. Right, and you see how tight it is, right? This, but my, my, my wife says, my, my uh, younger brother years ago, um, we had a Christmas tree farm, and my younger brother had this foot warming dance he created so to, just to keep your, so your feet moving so you didn't get your feet freezing while we were standing out selling Christmas trees in the middle of blizzards and nobody's coming. And my, my, he taught it to my wife, and she's going, no, this reminds me of that. <laughs> yeah. You know, you're sitting in the middle of winter, and you've got to that too. move, and nice. there's no place to move to, so... <laughs> What does there to do? Okay, where if you can't see, because all these people are saying, "Oh yeah, yeah, the winter months. That's when they got a lot of a lot of their sewing done." And going, are you kidding? Have you ever dark. been in those? You know how dark that is. Mm -hmm. We're talking about the north here. That's the, you know, the land of the midnight sun. Yeah, no, at that time, that's the land of no sun. <laughs> and it's a way to keep warm. You and so you're keeping yourself warm. You you're keeping getting the story. You're getting the, the community. And it's something you can do in that small space. Yeah. So what is you, you see how the, the music and the, the, this tradition evolved. You're going, yeah, this makes so much sense, mm -hmm. right? Keeps you from getting depressed when it's so dark. Yeah. 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 And and these are and and like I say, the, in the Faroe Islands, they are still doing these, and they've been doing these for you know hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. they don't, we don't know exactly how far back they dates to. Mm -hmm. um, I'm still trying to, to get a little bit, but I suspect they don't know. In the Faroe Islands, there's a little uh, little group of islands that's um, north of England, between kind of in the triangle between Iceland and, and are they and, and an Norway. Icelandic possession? It's uh, Denmark. Denmark. Yeah. and it's a Danish origin culture. Yeah. 
but a different language. Or um, dialect, I guess. It says what happens when you pit, put people on an island and leave them there. Mm -hmm. Does they kind of change them their own way or don't change at all, and everybody else changes? Um, the interesting thing about you know when I look, when I try to uh, starting to learn my, my Norse pronunciation, I depend on my my Laurel for her pronunciation because she learned it as a child because she's from Gimli, Manitoba, oh. and the re the thing about, that's important about Gimli is. It's in the middle of nowhere in Manitoba. Like, there's nothing else anywhere close to it. And it's all settled by a bunch of Icelanders that came on just before NATO put things into Iceland. And the, the thing is that until that time, Iceland had very little trade with anybody else. And until NATO there came over and started getting um, Norwegians and, and Swedes and Danish changing the language, it was as pure Norse as you could possibly get because it just hadn't changed and now Gimli Manitoba isn't changing. Same thing if you want to learn um, some certain versions of Gaelic, you go to the east coast in, in Canada and Cape Breton still does their Scottish Gaelic because they also came over in the middle of nowhere, no language didn't change. Um, and as, an, as you know, when I'm trying to track this stuff down, this is, one of the, this is why I love Adams. See, okay, find me somebody who hasn't got anybody talking to them. They're the ones I want to find out, and you know, we're we're the some of the things that I've been playing for you. Um, we're getting um, from wax recordings in the 1900s, and we love them, but they're it's still 1900s, but it's as early as we can get. Anyway, um, I have no idea how my time is. Oh, different ages is interesting. How is my time? Uh, it's, oh, actually, it's, yeah, it's 3.55, so five minutes to change classes. If so, is there, um, here's my, so I haven't, like I said, I'm still working on this, but if, if you're, if you're interested enough, I can, I can send you stuff. Um, that's my email address. Um, this is me. That's me. I didn't put down rig. I'm also, I've also belonged to a, a group called Dark, and if you search for Norse music, you'll probably find one of my earlier papers on running around the internet, it's it fairly high. Um, I don't know, any people have questions? Like I said, I've covered a lot of stuff, and it, there, there wasn't really, I'm still, I'm, I'm, I'm not an ethnomusicologist, but I'd like to be. Because <laughs> I find, I, I love the interconnections between these, and, and trying to figure out, okay, what is indigenous, and what is coming in, and why is it coming in, and when did it come in, and how did that change the music, right? When did that music change, what was it before? And if you have no information, you go like, okay, I just have to guess at everything. My brother makes real fun of me, so, okay, so you're using the artifacts and trying to use the artifacts on to recreate the music, so you can interpret it from the culture, so you can interpret the culture from the music. Yeah, okay. <laughs> of course, I tell my students, everything is connected to everything else. Yes. Exactly. You, there are some historic artifacts, instruments pulled out of peat bogs and such. Give us some clues, or yeah. you showed us a liar <laughs> that was from the 17th century. Um, so um, that's another that's another um, thing. But uh, um, so um, we've got liars. There's, there's been about seven dug up so far. Um, unfortunately, one of them was lost during World War II and the other one was drunk. It had what? been put in alcohol to preserve it and the oh. Russian foe soldiers found it. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and that unpreserved it. <laughs> unpreserved. Um, we've got a couple of pictures on standing stones. We've got uh, tons of images in in books. So liars, we, we've got left, right, and center. Um, we've got... Idea what they oh. look like. Yeah, we've got the same thing with triangular harps um, within the Norse context. You, um, you, you were quoting the medieval congress, which is happening right now in the couple hours away in the same state here. Just, yeah, um, I, I love this. This is a lovely story about a, he gets tied up and, and put in a, a snake pit, and he plays the, the, the harp with his toes and puts all the snakes to sleep, all except for one who's a music lover or a tone deaf or something. He so puts burrows into his heart and kills him. Oh. <laughs> Tough luck, Gunnar. Right. Um, and uh, 
This is, this oh, is the, that's the what bold, it looks like. The bold liar. So oh. this is what I can say. They, they play it with the back of their knuckles. Mm. That's weird. It's, um, it's definitely weird. There is a, a folk fiddle from uh, Bulgaria, Romania area, which uh, looks kind of like a rebic. Yeah. He has sympathetic vibrating strings like the hardanger fiddle, and the top string you're supposed to play with your fingernails rather than the pads of your fingers. But it's it's, I it's a gadolka. I, I have a gadolka, and I said it's persona as a rabbit because it pretty much looks like a rabbit. Yeah. It's got all those. I'd be interested in its, in its history because again, I don't know. You know, if things are coming up from the south and influencing the north, was there stuff going south again down their trade routes? I don't know, but that one's in the Bulgaria. Um, anyway, as far as other instruments, uh, we've got whistles and flutes galore. This is the this is the, uh, the one from New York that I mentioned. Oh, there it is. Um, this is a version from from Christmas in Germany. So um, we've got pipes. Um, okay. um, these are this is a pair of that I these are mine, Ooh. but they're they're reproductions of the Osberg ones, and I think they're really cool because they only they're whistles. They're just they're just signaling devices, but they're found on a boat context. Now I don't know what you but. They look, I don't know if you guys know what blaying pins are. You Is that just, something you tie ropes to? Yeah. Um, basically, you, 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 you have a, a uh, have your, your knot, and you, all you have to do is take the rope and go in a figure eight, oh, right. and it locks it off. Yeah. And when you're, when you're sailing, it's one of the, it's one of the things that are really important that you can do fast. I haven't done enough research to find out whether they actually have blaying pins in, in the North Sailing context. Um, but if they did, because that's what a blank pin exactly looks like, with a little bit of extra ornamentation is going. So, did a sailor take a blank pin and just kind of whittle it, or was it the fact that you want a signaling device that you just stick in a hole it then so you didn't lose it? Um, um, there's a lot of the instruments we have are folk instruments. We just kind of trust that they haven't changed any. Um, a lot of shepherd's instruments. This is a stone flute that um, basically you take a bark of a tree and you just <laughs> done. Um, this is uh, Elderberg, it, so it's spring's the time you want to make these. They only last a couple weeks, then they crack and they're useless. Um, and it's not been preserved. Yeah, but everybody knows how to make them, right? And it's a humid climate, too, so you're not going to get much organic material. Yeah. But, you, but, but uh, all, all, you get all the notes by, by, by plugging and unplugging the, the, the end. Okay. Um, cool. And, and horns, we've got these lures, um, one made out of horn. One's made of birchwork with horn at the end. Again, this is the same thing. Rap, 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 rap. Done. Particularly um, birchwood, sure. Yeah. Birchwork. Yeah. Um, reed instruments, we've got this. The problem with reed instruments, I don't know if you can just, how well you can see this, um, triple pipes, right? The problem with reed instruments, you can't see whether it's a reed instrument or not. And of course, the reed instruments are not going to be preserved that way, but you're going, that really looks like the, the triple pipes you find in Sardinia. And, and you're going, so it probably is, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. Um, this is one, an artifact they actually found. And if you look at it, you're going, okay, so it obviously had a cap on the end, right? Now, while it could be a fipple instrument, nobody does caps, tapered caps like that for a fipple instrument. Right? But you instrument? Like, like a recorder. Oh, okay. No reed and no embouchure. Oh, but but because if it but, they, like you, but you do find them on reed instruments. They're going right? to taper because they got to hold the reed. And the other thing is that um, the the flared bell you don't find in recorder context. Okay. Only in oh. the reed instruments later on. So you're going. You know everything says this is probably a reed instrument. And the flared bell is there to fix the intonation, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so this was this was this must have been a capped instrument, with a you know, um, so it was less likely to be something like a shaman, more of something like a like a corner muse or well, sorry, um, I went one. to a concert in Chicago once where they were doing medieval harp, and it was a, they, she said she had a harp from about 1300, except she said that. It was a replica, and the only resources they had to work with was references and old poems and images in stained glass windows. I mean, it just was nothing preserved. Yeah. So they had to basically reconstruct what they thought the harp might have looked like. And then people are going, well, we've got pictures of them with bells and things, yeah. but it, you know, when is it an instrument, when is it a, sound, a noise maker? Because um, they've got hundreds of bells that they've, that they've actually got. They're, they're made out of folded iron and, and covered in brass and whatnot. 
Um, just in the last year or two, there's been a, a bunch that have been reproduced um, by, by some experimental archaeologists um, connected with the Museum of Ireland. If you ever get to Dublin, they've got a fabulous museum. I like taught the curator how to know that. What were the so the bells, hundreds of bells used for signaling in war, used for processionals. We don't know. Church context. For cows. And were they? And the problem is, but and, and the thing is, again, were they pre or post Christian? And that's another thing. Going, that 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 line of what Christian Christianity did to to the culture. Who knows? Anyway, and one thing we don't have is, at all is drums. The, the Sami, the, the, the native fin, Finnish, have, have drums, but there's no, there's no recording of any writing. There's no writings that talk about it. There's no um, artifacts, obviously, because you're talking about hide and, and, and wood. You, know, could, you can just use anything in a storage container. That, you know, that's not a storage container, but it's drums. It's not proof to me. Sure. Um, this guy, he, he said, oh, this is the... His, his, this is my reproduction of the Glastonbury drum. I'm going, yeah, I don't think so. I don't, I don't, how can you prove that? To them, that to them? It just looks like a wood box to me. Um, and then other instruments like the the, the Jews harp, the moon harp, the card, and uh, that's everywhere in Europe. And you know, if you ever go to Penzik, the, the, uh, the Russian merchant um, under the big tree, um, always, it always has several versions of these cells. And one of these days I'll buy one. That's, yeah. Um, anyway, does that answer your question? Sure. Yeah, <laughs> oh man, another weird thing. Next like class? That. Yeah, it's to be the next class. That would be nice. That's you? Yes, it's me. <laughs> I didn't, I'm sure I shouldn't have gone on. Oh, that's well, I don't think, no.